uh, I was hoping I might be able to mm -hmm. use it for fellowships, scholarships, but they told me I, I went to a Besden, Sakhalofa was, and it's right, it's the Sakhalofa, when money is collected for a particular stucca, it's for that stucca, and for no other stucca, and it's not allowed to switch from stucca A to stucca B. So that's the story. Anyway, but the story I want to tell you is why is this grave here? Why is, so we put up a Matseva here, and we brought thousands of people here uh, when we put up the Matseva, and a few years later, uh, huge groups of Beis Yaakov graduates from all of Israel and all of America came here to celebrate her, her 50th yard site and so on, and later yard sites. Anyway, Sarah Schneira died in 1935, and uh, uh, her, she was 52 years old. So she was born in Krakow to a Belzer family, a Hasidic family, and uh, uh, in, uh, she was a seamstress. Famous story, it's in all it's every biography of Sarah Schneira. She was a seamstress and she was measuring, you know, dress measurements for, for a woman. And this woman kept saying, no, that's, uh, that's not tight enough, or it's too tight, whatever it is, or it's too high or too short. Every time she was measuring, she had to change it again because the woman wasn't satisfied. If she should look in a mirror, it had to be. And then she said to herself, and she said it out loud, imagine that, imagine for a dress, a person is willing to take all the time in the world and make sure the measurements are perfect and it can't be either too wide or too narrow, whatever the case may be. And that's for physicality. And for the spiritual world, nobody cares. That's what she said. Nobody's interested in measuring their, their spiritual growth and whether it's growing properly or not. And she had in mind, of course, the fact there was no education for Orthodox Jewish girls. All the boys were going to yeshivas. All the girls were going to public school as they were developing at the beginning of the 20th century, and you couldn't make a shidduch. Because those girls, once they went, they spoke Polish, they were beautiful, they were uh, in many ways acculturated, if not assimilated, and the, uh, the men were, uh, were boors, uh, you know, sitting and learning, uh, they didn't know a word of Polish, they had no contact with these girls. And she saw that it was the end of Judaism. The rabbis didn't see it, but she saw it. Anyway, she said she has to do something about it, but whatever, wherever she went in Krakow, they, everybody laughed at her and they said, you know, forget about it. Uh, as World War I broke out, many people left Krakow, she was one of them, and they went, it was safer to be in Vienna. So she went to Vienna uh, and spent the war years in Vienna, and she ended up renting a room in one of the districts of Vienna, I think it was the 19th district, you know, not, not the second district, not Leopoldstadt, but mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the lesser Jewish districts. And the rabbi was a, uh, his name was Rabbi Flesch. He was a Hirschian, a follower of Samson Raphael Hirsch. A uh, great Talmud Chacham and a wonderful speaker. And she, every Shabbos she went to shul, she would listen to him speak. And for the first time in her life, she heard that, you know, a Jew could be religious, and a Jew, a Jew could be a scientist, and a Jew could be a lawyer, and a Jew could be a doctor, and a Jew should be able to think and, and study and so on. And, she loved every word of it. She became a new person. She came back to Krakow after the war. In 1917, she opened the first Space Yakov, an elementary, first grade, elementary school. Those days, they didn't have pre-kindergarten. So first grade. <laughs> what year was that? 19? 1917. She, she opens the first Space Yakov here in Krakow. We, we will maybe walk on Shabbos and we'll see. Middle more. of the war. No, to end of the war. I'm not talking about the first yeah. world war. Yeah, end of the war. The end of the war. Oh, 17. So she comes back yeah. and she opens up the first uh, Beis Yaakov. And it's unbelievable. Hmm. And initially, of course, it's difficult to find no one who wanted to send their daughter to an experimental school. You know how that is. But little by little, it, it really grew tremendously. And there's a first grade, a second grade, another first grade, a third grade, a first grade, and a fourth grade, a first grade, and a fifth grade. And it becomes tremendous, uh, and she's uh, incredibly successful in, uh, it, and if you'll read the history books, you'll see that before she opened it in, 19, in 1917, she went to the Belzer Rebbe, because the father told her, you can't do this unless uh, the Rebbe says it's permissible, otherwise you can't do it. And the Rebbe said, Mazel the uh -huh. Rebbe told her, do it. And she did it. So uh, uh, at that time, Agudas Yisrael was already founded, was growing immensely. Uh, this was a Jewish religious response, in a certain sense, to modernity, organizing Jewish life, uh, making sure that we had lobbyists 
you know, in Congress, doing everything that needs to be done for the Jewish people. So uh, Akuduk saw what she was doing, they realized right away, this is incredible. And they also realized she couldn't do it by herself. So the world Aguda, one of the great rabbis who was involved at that time was Rabbi Leo Young, if you know your American Jewish history. Uh, he got heavily involved, raised huge sums of money for Aguda all over the world. And uh, he was on the executive board. And many other people also got together, all of them members of Aguda. And basically, Aguda took over the Basiakal movement. And, I, and with the back, with the backing of Aguda, with the money of Aguda, and with the Moetzes Gdole Torah of Aguda, Chafetz Chaim wrote a letter, distributed widely, saying it is a mitzvah for Jewish girls to go to uh, Beis Yaakov. Remember, they had secular education. Half a day was secular study. Still is. Uh, they were reading Polish literature. They were reading German literature. Uh, they, they, were, they were reading Goethe in German. You know, all the great writers, Schiller, all the great writers uh, of that time that were, you know, people were still reading in the, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, and I have the curriculum. You can get a list of the curriculum <laughs> of the first Beis Yaakov. It's unbelievable to read this. Anyway, so half a day is secular study, half a day is religious study, which is unheard of in Poland and uh, for Jews. And she's eminently successful. Uh, when she died in 1935, there were 200 Beis Yaakov schools in Poland. That was bad. 200 Beis Yaakov mm -hmm. schools, 35,000 students. That's when she died. And now there are thousands of Beis Yaakov I don't all know what the number of students is, but it's a huge number of students all over the world. So uh, this is, and this woman, we would come here and there's nothing. There wasn't one sign. Her, her, she, in 1923, she founded a teacher's seminary because they realized very quickly that where are they going to get teachers? Who could teach these kids in all these schools that are mushrooming all over the world? And they had to train the teachers. So she, she becomes the founder of a teacher's seminary and they bring in major heavyweights. Jewish historians, rabbis, expert in Talmud, to teach in the Jewish seminary. Seminary, Rabbi Orlean, if you know the name. Uh, he was my uncle. He was your uncle, so you're there. Married you're to married my to aunt. aunt. Married to your aunt. Okay, well, you're a smart man. You see. Anyway, so uh, 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 he came in. Uh, there was uh, Rabbi Leo Deutschlander, amazing man from Vienna. Who came, these people laid down their lives for this teacher seminary. They came here. And uh, Sarah Schneer really stayed in charge of the lower Beis Yaakov schools. She gave over the teacher seminary to, uh, to these other people, but she taught in the teacher seminary as well. Anyway, that teacher seminary built a fantastic building in 1927. It's still standing. We'll walk over maybe Shabbos and take a look at that building, um, which was recently given back to the Jewish community. Um, so uh, she, incredible building. She built a teacher seminary built it from scratch right here in, in Krakow and I used to take groups there nothing no sign it was it was a school it became a school in Poland but a, you know a secular school for a certain group but uh, had nothing to do with Jews not one son, not one word on it this was the the base Yaakov teacher seminary of Krakow and here's where all the famous women that you know Pearl Benish all those who wrote Sila books they my all aunt. studied here in Krakow in this seminary. okay so uh, Anyway, I, this wonderful girl went out, and lots of others. She wasn't the only one, but she did the most work, probably. We had the money, and then I flew back to Poland a few times to get arrangements. Nothing happens in Krakow without a man named Jakubowicz, mm. a descendant of the Rabaisical Binyakov Shul. Uh, he must be a very old man now, but uh, he was in charge of all Jewish life here, and you couldn't get a, uh, a doorknob for a, for a door unless he approved it. For, for a Jewish building. Anyway, we, we got to him, we sat with him, worked with him. He finally agreed that we could build a, a Matseva here. And I had to find where to build a Matseva. And i only take a minute. I, don't wanna, I know you were, were, you'll stop me if we, if we go too far. Just to tell you, uh, so she died in 1935 and there was a Matseva here. There is no photograph in the world of the Matseva that and every year on the yard site, thousands of Beisiaco girls would come here every year from 1935 to till the war, till 1939. They would come here. They would say to Hillam here. Nobody took a picture. No one took a picture. Here is the, if you can find a picture, please let me know. No one. To, I spoke to every living graduate of Beisiaco of Krakow. There now maybe two left, one or two left. They all have died. 
uh, you realize there were, there were young women in, in 19, before 1935, or, you know, they could have been here after 35, but they were still very, very young. So, Many of them perished in the Holocaust. Now it's 2017, so uh, you know, you're not going to find such people. Not only did nobody take a photograph, but I asked personally, I went around in Jerusalem, in New York, to, uh, if, to if to do much research to get the names of who's still alive, you know, and asked them, just tell me, what did it say on the Matzeva? Nobody could tell me a word about Matzeva. Nobody remembered remember it was a Matzeva, we came and we said, uh, you know, we said to Hillam and so on. I couldn't get a word. And then finally, someone told me, recall how I found out, but someone told me there's, there's a Jew still alive in Brooklyn who was in Plashov, a survivor of Plashov, who said that he saw the Matseva, he remembers the Matseva. I couldn't believe it. I, I live in Kew Gardens yeah. Hills. I immediately right drove. I, I learned Shabbos afternoon, Motsei Shabbos, I was in his house. I wanted to get there before he died. <laughs> <laughs> he must so, have been uh, very old, huh? He, he was very old. And we filmed him. We have it actually. We have a video. Anyway, I went to see him and I asked him, "What can you tell me about Soros Nier's Matzevus?" Oh, what could I tell you? He said, "I'm the person who chopped it down. I was a slave in. Uh, I was in Plashov. I was one of the first people in Plashov. They took us, a group of us. They brought us to the cemetery here, and they told us they brought, gave us axes, and our job was to Great. chop down every Matzeva." in the cemetery. And he said he couldn't do it. He tried. I mean, he couldn't do it physically. He didn't have the strength. He tried. He would hit various tombstones. And finally, they, they slapped him and they kicked him. And uh, the, the Nazis themselves sometimes had on a large stone. It was a large stone. They, they had to do it themselves. But he told me he came to Sora Schneer's Matseva. And all he could remember is the word Atsnoa that's why I put it on here. Those are the two words he remembered. He'll never forget. He saw those at the top line, and he struck it with an axe, but he couldn't destroy the matzeva. The Nazis took the axe from him, and they destroyed the matzeva. So at least I had two words from the, from the matzeva. And her name. And her name, of course, I know. Everything else I wrote. So that came. Those words came from him. And what I decided to put on here, Sarah Schneer wrote a will, the last will and testament. Yiddish, and I took the language from her last will and testament, some of the most beautiful lines, and I put them on the matzah. So I'll just read it quickly and then we're done. Ich endig mit meine alte psukim, I end my last will and testament with my old, my favorite verses, the old verses of the Bible. Velech zelenech, ständig begleiten. They should accompany you wherever you go. These were her favorite verses. Ibdu es Hashem is simple. By the way, I'm going to give you beautiful pictures from the day we first put this up. Sadly, I'm going to I'm going to speak to her if I should. If this has to be redone, you can see the letters. Some of them can't be read anymore. Ichendig mit meine al psukim vele chazel and I extending the great mission always. And these are the verses. Ibdu es Hashem is simple. Worship God, enjoy. Shivisi Hashem lenegdi samid. I place God before your eyes always. Reishis Chachma Yiras Hashem, the beginning of wisdom, is the fear of the Lord. Limnos Yomenu Kein Hoda, teach us how to count our days. I'm going to come back to that in a minute because that's the odd verse out. Torah Hashem, to me, Mamashivas Nofesh. The Torah of God is perfect and wholesome, uh, it restores the soul. These were her favorite verses, but this one in particular, the one which is strange, is many of them are from Tehillim, not all of them. Limnos Yomenu Kein Hoda, which is teach us how to. Uh, it's very strange because that comes from a psalm where in the psalm it says, Yemesh no Senu Shivim Shona. The number of years, it already says, a human being lives 70 years. In that same psalm, a few verses later, it says, Limno, tell us how to count. What do you mean, tell us how to count our, our, our Yomenu, which means our years, really? Tell us how to count our years. It just said, we're going to live 70 years, so we know how many years we're going to live. And she, her, she got this from Samson Raphael Hirsch. It's in his commentary on Taylor, but it became a favorite commentary. And she said as follows: She said, "Lenosiyahenu, doesn't mean count the years so you know whether you reach seventy or not. But um, teach us, God, Kain Hoda, please teach us how to make our days count. count. 